Welcome to another episode of the Momentum Interview Series. Today, I'm speaking to Ross Thor, CEO and founder of Red J, which helps managers be more effective without creating extra work. Ross, thanks so much for making the time to speak with us today. Let's start off with an easy one. What's something unexpected about you that most people don't know? So what most people don't know is that I've spent my whole life in tech. I am the rare breed that's never had a non-tech job in my entire life. I actually grew up in the heart of Silicon Valley. My dad started his own company in the early 90s. So I used to uh, commute in with him and help him do odd jobs in a software office. So I'm the rare breed that actually grew up in this. And I'm one of those people that never had a non-tech job. You started your career in the year 2000. Give us a very brief walkthrough of your journey in the game. Just, just the highlight reel. It's been fun. I started by selling... Oh, in the early 2000s, we were selling software to put the uh, internet on your phone. You just pushed the buttons. It was kind of not really what you're used to today. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, I actually sold a product called the cloud. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, back in the day, you released your product and people accessed it through a server. And we emulated the like latency and packet loss. The product was actually called the cloud. Um, after that, I had my first kind of Silicon Valley success story working at Success Factors, where we started automating a lot of the HR processes around performance management. I joined, it was like sub 50 people, sub 10 million in revenue, all the way through IPO. That was really amazing experience. After that, I had another fun one early at Box, the whole file sharing movement. I was the first externally hired sales manager at Box to help them really scale through. And then people thought I was crazy because I left before the IPO to join this really small Irish startup called Intercom. I joined them like right around a million in ARR. I had to convince Owen, the CEO, that he could really use a sales team and a salesperson, because I actually ran into him at a box event. And I thought, oh my gosh, this product makes so much sense. I wanted to use it at box. And then I was like, can I just come work for you? And so that was my next experience, taking that one, one to like tens of millions of revenue. That was my first VP of sales position there. And after that, I took some time off. I helped uh, Airtable get their first sales motions going. I helped launch Darkly get their first sales motions going. And then I became the first uh, VP of sales and success at Envoy. You're taking that from single digits to you know, tens of millions in revenue as well. And now I've, uh, I'm starting my own company. So it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey. Love that. I love how you seem to come in right at the beginning and then scale up and then leave once you've almost, it's almost as if you get to a point where you're like, okay, I've accomplished what it is that I came here to do. It's time for me to find another challenge. Would you say that's a correct reading? Yeah, I like being, that's why I'm starting my own company. Cause I kept joining these companies earlier. I'm like, well, I'm gonna start one from scratch. Cause I love the building phase. I love the creating phase. Once everything's what they call the flywheels completely spinning and you got it on mm. repetition. That's where I'm like, All right, I'm gonna go build the next one. Okay, so uh, I want to say don't get too big at Red J because then you might leave that one too. But I guess what I should actually <laughs> be saying is scale it as big as you can and then you'll build another Red J or another company in the future. When, when you think about your current role, what do you spend most of your time doing? So being a CEO at a product starting from scratch is my life has now moved from, well, it's still customer facing, mm. but it's much more product. It's much more trying to figure out what we should be building. How should we be talking about it? It's been really interesting going from a sales background where you're trying to figure out how to sell a thing that's already built mm -hmm. to now trying to figure out what to actually build. Mm -hmm. um, I have a whole new respect for product managers and designers. So <laughs> that's probably, we, that's a whole other topic. We'll mm -hmm. still, let's stick more to like the sales background. <laughs> What's one point of friction that's affected the relationship between employees and managers today? Because I mean, your company does a lot of work around that area. So what's the, what are the friction points that you've identified so far? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is remote. And it's, it's just changed 
everything. Mm-hmm. Like obviously COVID was a global, I mean, it's still, I guess it's not done yet, mm. but it just changed the whole dynamic of how we worked in such an abrupt, urgent way. And how I draw the parallel to what's happening right now is that I, I started my sales career 15 years ago in inside sales. When all of a sudden people thought, oh, nobody's ever going to spend 25, 50K on software if you don't meet them in person. And we're like, watch, we can do this by leveraging WebEx. And, and it, of course, we didn't have COVID. So that took a while to really convince and show people it would work. Whereas what we've just been experiencing is that remote management can work in the same way. We just absolutely condensed that. And so now people are trying to figure out how do you manage remotely? What's, what's very fascinating is sales has been doing remote telesales, inside sales, court, whatever you want to call it. So it's not that abrupt change for sales teams, but what it is is really for managers. And how do you get a lot of these things done that you used to do in person? Speaking of remote working and the pandemic, there's a lot of talk around work-life balance in the workplace, especially during COVID-19. So what are some ways that managers can institute and encourage work-life balance in their workplaces? Yeah, I'm a big proponent of the manager needs to lead by example. Hmm. As I think if you're saying, oh, everybody have work-life balance, but your manager's available at all times. Hmm. And you see your manager and you're getting emails and you're like, okay, this manager's saying one thing, but doing another. Hmm. People always follow what they do. So I think there's a big, I think we need to lead from the top. And you know, I, I personally is now experiencing remote work and it is hard to separate because I'm just like, oh, I can go hang out with my kids and then I go back to work. Mm. But like work is always here. There's not as much mm. separation between an office and life. Mm. But I think it's very important to show as a manager, as a leader, to show what should it look like. When was the last time you went on vacation, Russ? <laughs> I think my position's a little different at an early startup, uh, especially just having to do everything. But let's see, we did actually, no, I take that back. We went on, uh, we went to Yosemite like a yeah. month ago. How can companies turn their one-on-ones from awkward, potentially dread-inducing events into something productive and enjoyable that both parties can look forward to? <laughs> yeah. So this is something I think a lot about. Mm. Um, And what we've, the biggest thing we've learned so far is that the manager has been told they have to have one-on-one. And then the direct report, Mm. you know, depending on the manager, doesn't find them valuable. Mm. But it's sort of both sides know it's like it's time they need to spend together. And then there's also not a lot of knowledge of what does a good one-on-one meeting look like? Mm. It's almost a black box of, you hear these things you're supposed to do, but you don't really know what a good one looks like. Mm -hmm. And especially in the sales world. So what happens is they turn into mini status update, pipeline reviews, sort of Mm -hmm. grilling sessions because you're like, okay, let's make sure we're gonna hit the number. And the way you're going to hit the number is by talking about the number more and not like what are the behaviors that you should be doing to get better at it. So the biggest thing that we're actually doing is how can we give more insight into are you having good one-on-ones or not? And I think the most important part is do both sides find it valuable? How can you keep working at it to make it more valuable? What are some of the trends in workplace relationship management that companies should be aware of? Yeah, I think the biggest one is like I've talked about is this move to remote is that we can start capturing more of what's happening. Like the pre the pre remote world, everything was based on in person interactions, and you had to rely on your memory, and then you had to rely on writing things down. Hmm. Whereas now everything we do is really digital. Mm. It's like you're even your Slack at most, if you're living in your work productivity app, you're doing Zoom calls like this. Mm. Is there's just so much more data that you could start to sift through 
mm-hmm. and get a picture of what is, you know, what does good management look like? Are you doing the right good management things? Mm-hmm. You know, who is like a good manager? What are they doing? Can we copy what they're doing and other people do? And then can you match up to those behaviors? Mm-hmm. So we're just starting to produce a lot more data that'll start showing us more around management rather than the previous way, which was, are you doing a good job? I don't know. Let's go do a survey and find out. Mm. Like, let's go, you know, let's force you to take all these notes, like fill out all these things and tell us. Mm. We're like, this is duplicative work. I'm like, I'm, why are you telling me to take all this time to do something that nobody cares about? And then while at Box, you hired and developed 50 plus reps in under two years. That's, that's a huge accomplishment. Uh, what was that journey like? And, and what are some of the key takeaways from that period in your career? When you have to hire so fast, it's just hard to really do quality interviewing. And so I think, you know, what I really learned is how can you push like your current people farther Mm. and then just make sure you're not like breaking the team by bringing too many people in because there used to be, this has changed too. There used to be a philosophy of we could grow revenue faster if we have more heads. Mm. Just simple, right? Well, if everybody has a million dollar quota and we hired 10 people, we're going to go 10, do 10 million. So let's just go hire 10 people. Um, and there's just so much that goes into making sure they're ramped, making sure you're getting the top people, you're making sure you're training them, onboarding. There's just like, we underestimated how much it really takes to get that many people productive that fast. KPS aside, what instincts are you looking for when you're considering whether to promote someone on your team? The eight that we put together were discovery. So there's just, you know, being able to run a call, asking mm-hmm. open-ended questions. There's time management. You know, is the sales rep prioritizing their time correctly? Are they good at delivering price? So they really have to be able to know how to not discount. Mm-hmm. Are they good at project managing? So most of the time in sales, there's a time management, but there's always, you know, triangulating and understanding all the different people involved in the sale and making sure mm-hmm. the sale keeps going. The majority of a salesperson's job is forecasting. So are they good at accurately understanding how much business is going to come? Do they know the product? You know, are they just reliant on a sales engineer and mm-hmm. they don't even know what they're selling? Are they helping the team? Especially if this is somebody who wants to be a manager. Are they more focused on the good of the team or just themselves? And then finally, you have to have a passion for the customer. So you got to make sure is this a sales rep who's selling good deals to their deals, expand to their deals, renewal, renew. And so those are the eight things, fundamentals we used to look at to say, Hey, this person is ready to become a manager. Then there's different ones too, because, you know, there's a different skill set needed for somebody who wants to become a manager versus somebody who wants to become an enterprise rep. Mm-hmm. They're coming and they want to work their way up, but they were still, they were still pretty much in that ballpark. So we, we wrote it down and we very much adhered to those fundamentals. Let's talk tools for a little bit. What's your sales stack like at Reggie? Well, I think, you know, we're very early, so we don't really have a sales stack. <laughs> but I could talk through, I could talk through what I'm, so I talk to a lot of sales teams right now. Mm-hmm. And the most common tools that I see that are really like game changing, everybody still has to use Salesforce. It's basically like the database layer now. Mm. And what's interesting, like I talked about as we move remote, Mm. is how many sales tools are being built that help provide insight without people having to do anything. I've been really interested in like Chorus and Gong and all the things they're doing to provide insight. Companies like Outreach that are automating like all the touch points. I remember all the like, you'd have to just do it manually and remember and set reminders and they have all of that like on autopilot. There's even tools like Dually and Scratchpad where you can go ahead and automate. You can, (laughs) what's funny is they're just built right on top of Salesforce but it helps with that note taking. It helps with the updating. It just keeps life so much cleaner. 
And, and of course, the biggest thing that I've seen sales teams adopt is Slack. Is it's just so much easier to just stay on top and be able to use all these different resources. Because back in the day, if you wanted something done, you'd have to hover somebody over somebody's desk. And you'd be like, can you, can you do this? Can you do this? Whereas now, you know, not even in the office, that became so much harder. Whereas Slack is that is that tool where just a lot of the conversa internal conversation happens. And I've even seen <laughs> the newer things too I've seen is using Slack to really communicate with customers. Mm. It's like, it's a new channel because as email gets like drowned out is I've seen Slack starting to open up and be how you communicate with your customers. Let's go over to culture and hiring. So what kind of culture have you tried to build at Red J and how's that been going for you and your team? Yeah, I, I always have, I always have something that I focus on that I keep pretty simple. Mm -hmm. And so when we talked about the fundamentals is that my culture is just practice the little things mm. is there's no secret sauce. There's no, we know some unique way on how to work that we're not going to tell anybody. That's just mm. <laughs> not true. So I'm a big believer in like, we're going to do all the little things. You know, that's why I wrote down those sales fundamentals. It's like, that's what mm -hmm. we're just going to practice. And then I think the next one too, is that you need to have a passion for the team. Mm -hmm. Cause that's ultimately where it comes from is that you're working together. You can't have a lot of lone wolves is, you know, I could use a lot of cliches, but like, you know, the team is more important, you know, one team, one dream, we kind of mm. say a lot. And then the last one I think too, is I used to call them, um, you know, champions do extra. Mm. Is that the thing that really sets people apart is that you have to do extra. And when I say extra, you have to pace yourself in extra. We used to, there's been blog posts and you can read about this, but it's like just an extra 1% per day. It's like, that's 15 minutes. Like, what are you doing to better yourself? What are you doing that's, that's more like each day? And if you do it each day, it compounds because this is based a lot on in sales. What you see is somebody will be behind their number and they just like start going crazy. But mm. then that's burnout because they're peaks and valleys. They, I like the rep that just consistently hits their number. Mm. And like, they're not waiting till the last day of the quarter. It's like, nope, they, they hit it like with a month ago. And that's the people I celebrate. So otherwise you just get exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I say it's like the champions do extra and you can, you know, there's always those like great athletes. They were the first to show up to practice. They were the last mm -hmm. to leave at practice, but they weren't the ones that like, okay, they're going to sprint a hundred thing for like two days. It's like, no, they did it consistently. So that's just, you know, that's the culture. And then, you know, I think the literal, little culture aspects that I'm a big fan of is uh, transparency. I'm a big believer in any decisions. It needs a why. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? I'm also one that I like being challenged. It should never just be like, I said it, so everybody has to do it. It's like, how can we bring everybody into it? At a certain point in time, I need to make the decision. Not everybody's going to like it, but at least if you know why you can respect it. And if you don't like, well, it's probably not a good fit anyways. Um, but that tends to be the type of culture that I like to have in place. And I like, um, this is, you know, this is used a lot is that I like a team that's diverse. And so I think people talk about the like diverse demographics that you can easily see, but I'm also a big fan of, you know, like Abraham Lincoln had this book called The Team of Rivals, is that I want to make sure I have people who think differently than me, who have different life experiences than me, it's that I don't want to surround myself with a bunch of people like me, because that's just going to be a terrible company and a terrible team. So that's how I use the term diversity, is I think it means a lot more than just the, you know, demographics that you see. And then what's one experiment that you've run with your team lately that you're especially proud of? You know, I think the biggest, even the biggest test for me has been working remotely. This is my, my, my engineers are in Oklahoma. My designers in Portland. We have another designer in Buenos Aires. We are 
absolutely distributed team and we've been experimenting what's our touch points how do we need to communicate with each other what do we need to write down when do we need to jump on a zoom how often you know do we ever need to be in person yeah, i think all of this is just such an experiment and you just need to be open like is everybody getting what they want out of this are you are you more of an async communications person or at red j what type of communications do you guys use yeah, what I found is you you definitely have to write more. Is and I think that's really good habit to be in because I think, especially me, is my background. I've been more of an in person. I'm going to do flybys or drive bys, and we're going to do a team meeting. I'm going to talk, and I'm going to be like, okay, that just stuck, right? Everybody's good. And then you realize it didn't ever. It just made me feel good because I got to say it but it never really sunk in as much. Whereas now we're much better at, okay, what are we building? Why are we building? Can we write it all down? Can we write a story? Can we tell a story that people really get? And so it has to be a mixture. We're more async, mm. but then you still need the synchronous like, okay, I know you read it, but now repeat it back to me. <laughs> did you do you really get it and that's how we work is you have to read the asic first and then the synchronous is for like are we really aligned i need to hear you like so, tell yeah. me what you read and that's how we're working so you've probably been involved in a few hiring rounds in your career what's one trait or achievement to the candidate that would make you instantly swipe right and i mean select them i really like somebody who has a chip on their shoulder Hmm. and something to, prove. something to prove and who has a history of success hmm. is that I think there's, I think those two need to come together is that I'm not as impressed with like a lot of accolades they might have hmm. is that I want the person who can articulate numerous stories of I was, you know, whatever I was slow or whatever. And then hmm. I joined, I became a varsity basketball player. Or like, you know, this had never been done before and then I did it. Mm. Or like, I was new to this company, they had never done this thing before and then I did it and here was the results. Mm. As I really love patterns of that and then I really love them being able to articulate why and how. And so that's what I look for the most. Because mm. I think that level of drive and intelligence is something that can't really be taught. And those are the people I want to work with. I'll teach them all the rest of the stuff. Mm -hmm. But those mm -hmm. are the inherent tra traits. And I think what's very, I want to point out, because you even mm -hmm. said at the beginning of this, is that my background is I typically start early. Mm -hmm. So those are the early entrepreneurial people I love bringing in. Um, I will say, <laughs> you didn't ask that, but a little caveat mm -hmm. is, and I've learned this, is those people don't fit in. So you have to change that hiring model as you get to more of the repetitive motion. Because mm. if you bring those people in when it's repetitive and you have a process, they're going to want to change it. You're going to be like, no, 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 I don't want to change it right now. It's fine as I want is. people, Yeah, I want people to do more of it. Mm. Um, so like I said, I typically like joining early mm. and those are the people I like hiring. And like I said, I don't care their background I, like if they can show me that history of success with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder and why and how I am, a, I am sold. And then what would be an instant red flag for you? Um, people who use a lot of buzz terms and can't tell me why. Hmm. You, you get this a lot in sales interviewing is that you'll see they've come from good companies. You see they've hit their numbers and they've performed. But then you'll ask them, tell me about that deal. You know, tell me why. You'll find that they're in the right place at the right time. Like they just don't really have the depth to explain, oh, here's exact, I heard this. And so then I delivered this value and here are the steps I took along the way. They're just simply like, yeah, I reached out, brought my sales engineer in, brought my other mm -hmm. people in and we did a million dollar deal. It was great. You're like, I, I don't care. Like, I just need people to be able to have some depth, to be able to go to that level deeper. What metrics would you use to track the performance of a people leader? You know, this is one I think about a lot. 
Mm. Um, Because I think with the man, like in the world of sales, it's very quantified. So I think Mm. it's, you you definitely have to look at that. It's like Mm. how many people on their team are hitting quota? And then also how are they doing it? Like what's their deal size? What's their number? I also look at what's the retention rate of the customers. But then I think you get into the hard things of how do you measure a manager? Because then you do engagement surveys, but it's like, yeah, I guess. Because then I think you get into a lot of qualitative Mm -hmm. that gets so much harder that I think is important. So I think a good manager is how many people are they trying to promote on their team? Mm -hmm. How many of their reps are they really trying to get better that they would want them to like go to a better team, like to do something better? It's like, that's, that's an amazing people manager. Um, you know, what are they doing to help the company? What are they doing outside of just their team? So I think if you look at just like numbers, sure, you can have a good sales manager, hits their number, and you know, everybody's fine. But what creates a great manager? Mm. It's like, well, what are they doing for other managers? What are they doing for other teams? How are their people growing? Are their people getting promoted? And like, are they following the, the smaller things? How are they hitting their numbers? What's your best productivity tip? I, I have learned this over time. It's focus is don't take mm. on too many things. Mm. It's like, what's the one or two things you're going to do for the week that are going to move things or even if it's for the day. Mm. But I like what I've actually started to do now is I used to just think more was better. I'm like, mm. oh, I'm doing so many things. Look at how long my to-do list is. This is great. Mm. Whereas now it's just, what is the one thing that's really going to move the needle. Hmm. Let's just do, let's, let's focus on that. And what are the things and everything else, just noise. You just have to push it away. What's a recent book or podcast episode or talk that left a mark on you? Yeah, there's, there's some, well, like I said, right now I've been very much in the like startup world. Mm -hmm. Um, There's one I read, it was called Traversing the Traction Gap. It's by Bruce Cleveland, who actually knows my father. And I read through that and I was like, oh my God, this makes more sense for me. And like, what are the milestones I need to be hitting? Mm-hmm. So I think you, you hear all these like lean startups, mm-hmm. these, all these things you're supposed to be doing. But what I liked what, the way he wrote it, it just made a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. Like, this is the game you're in. This is what you have to prove. If you don't prove these things, you don't have like a billion dollar idea mm. and you know, should you be doing it or not? So I think that's like the biggest thing you need to do right now is, you know, is this the best use of your time? So I really like that one. Mm. And then the book I always recommend to people that I base a lot of my philosophy on is, it's called The Score Takes Care of Itself. And it's mm. by Bill Walsh. So it is a football book because he was the former head coach of the 49ers in the 80s when I was growing up. And But what I really like about that book is that's where I took the concept of the fundamentals is that, very paraphrasing, but what I really like that they did is like, listen, if we just focus on the fundamentals and we just focus on the team and helping each other, and we do a little bit of extra, we're going to win. You know, we don't need to obsess around like, what's the score? What's this thing? You know, I think that's funny at business. It's like, that's how a professional sports team works. And like, we have so many statistics about sports now. Like they don't sit in the game and like, oh my God, you know, you haven't, you need to do more assists right now. Mm -hmm. And like, that's how we run business. And that's how we run sales. Like, let's give you a crazy amount of numbers. It's like, no, let's, here's the fundamentals. Let's just teach you how to do the fundamentals. Let's make sure the team is cranking and you're doing it. Then you should just hit your number. And if you don't hit your number, like something's wrong with the business. You know, maybe we don't, you know, maybe we have too many reps. Maybe we're positioning incorrectly. You know, let's not try and grind it out in like all these metrics that just make us feel better, but don't actually do anything to move sales forward. 
If you weren't working in the organizational management space, what would you be doing professionally? If I wasn't doing red tape, I actually, I don't know. I think I'd probably just be back at some early startup and helping them go from like early days to scale. And the like space, you know, it's not as, I'm more interested in like who the people that I'd be working with, you know, what mm -hmm. is the mission? I really, I'm really driven a lot by who are the people I'm going to be working with and selling to. Hmm. Um, that's really like drives me more than like who I want to be in this space. And then if you're starting your career all over again, what's one thing you'd do differently? Uh, I'd go tell younger me to stop, to, to be more patient. Hmm. Early in my career, I definitely was like, how fast can I become a manager of VPs? Hmm. Like how fast can I do it? Because hmm. I wouldn't be so interested in fast. I would have told myself like, listen, this is just a little bump, wait it through. And you're going to learn so much more by waiting it through rather than like, all right, cool. Let's go try the next thing. Um, just patience. patience, patience to all the younger people out there. This is the biggest advice I'd give my younger ambitious self. That is a great piece of advice, Ross. Thank you so much for making the time to speak to me today and I'll catch you next time. You bet, Mom.